Well, uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all again. I'm Brian Utzi, if we haven't met. I'm one of the co-directors here at MECO. Uh, welcome to our weekly seminar. And it's going to be my pleasure to introduce Hal Peng in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to draw your attention to who's coming in the next few weeks. We have a really nice selection of people from many different backgrounds, engineering, computational social science, uh, communication schools, uh, schools of medicine, people with backgrounds in physics, computational work, engineering, biology, and across the board, which is what makes NICO such a fun place to be because you could put people from very different disciplines together, all working shoulder to shoulder. The other thing I'd like to mention is that um, many of the good things that we get to experience every week, like these great presentations, as well as the food is supported by Northwestern University, through, and also through grants of faculty here at NICO. So uh, if you're enjoying yourself, do talk it up to your advisors and other people at your schools, your dean, the president of the university, about just how much you love coming here every week. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is, you know, every time we have a speaker, you're more than welcome to sign up on a list or contact Emily uh, if you'd like to meet them. It's a really great opportunity to learn more about their research if you have an interest in it, what they're working on, what they're likely to work on in the future, job opportunities for yourself, and just generally a really great way to network. So do keep that in mind. Also, if there's someone who you'd really like to see, give a talk at the university, let us know. If we could work it into the schedule, we most certainly will. So that's my little pitch for the day. Uh, if you have any questions about it and I'm around, ask me more about it. But with that being said, please allow me to introduce Hao Peng. Uh, Hao Peng is a postdoc here at NICO. He received his PhD at uh, University of Michigan from the Information School, where he worked under Daniel Romero, one of the famous graduates uh, of the NICO postdoc program. He works here at the university with a number of us here at NICO, as well as with Agnes Horvat over in communications. I'd characterize his work as really being in the space of computational social science with interests in innovation, uh, many different topics in the science of science, and I think pretty much open to many things with computational social science can be applied. If you look at his background, he's worked on a couple of different topics, very well published, several papers in PNAS, Science Advances, PRE, and other top journals. And uh, he's worked on issues of representation in the media of uh, scientists and their work, who gets the call from the journalist and who doesn't, something very important for marketing your own work. And it's the thing that universities care more and more about because science needs the media and media needs science. So do keep that in mind. I encourage you to take a look at his paper if you have more interest in that. Also does work on um, things related to retractions and most recently has gotten into work on not so much what you want to do as a scientist to improve your creativity, for which there's already been a lot of work. So, you know, team science is a way to improve your creativity. Thinking about your network is a way to improve your creativity. And he started to work on a different topic, which is once you've got something creative and innovative, how do you show its merits to other people? That is, how do you show the merits of good, innovative ideas to people reviewing your grant to see if you get money or not? How do you show the merits of your good ideas to people in journals so that they're more willing to embrace and understand the quality of the work that you've done? With all of that, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Hal. Hal, thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh... Very great introduction. I really like it. Uh, pretty much summarized my work I'm going to present. So uh, I'm really excited to talk about the research that I have been doing at NICO since 2022, which is about uh, less than two years ago. Um, and I'm going to talk about why and how to facilitate idea adoption in science. So before that, I want to talk a little bit about my old research area. So I study um, social and human factors involved in the production and dissemination of innovation. Uh, this falls into three research areas, computational social science, as Brian introduced, 
social networks, innovation management, and my research aims to generate insights that can help us leverage the full potential of humans to drive innovations in future organizations. This is really important in the face of AI, the growing capabilities of the machines, and how do we innovate human capabilities, right? So uh, one major stream of my research in this area is how to facilitate the adoption of novel ideas in science. Uh, and this adoption process is, is really important, and I study them in the whole scientific innovation pipeline, including funding, publishing, and the media. In the next section, through three studies, I show you guys uh, why this adoption process is much harder than we would expect. So first of all, uh, scientists have been long interested in understanding the relationship between different journals, right? Uh, at the level of academic journal and conferences, because these are the primary area venues we publish and read our papers or uh, communicate with people in the community. And existing Research has designed numerous journal classification system, like the UCSD map of science, the info map based on citation flow. These systems place journals into different disciplines, like biology, chemistry, physics. However, there is a one major limitation, which is this disjoint disciplinary categorization. It's pretty hard to do interdisciplinary measurement. For example, in a broad field or discipline? What are the similarity between two journals in the same discipline? What are the most similar journals? If you get rejected from one another, you can continue publishing the most similar one, right? There are real uh, good applications for these. So to solve these limitations, we design a graph embedding framework to learn the vector space representation of academic journals. And we apply this framework to the whole citation graph in the Microsoft Academic Graph Database. So this is a quick overview of our method. Given the citation network, we generate paper citation sequence using random walks. We first pick a node and follow the citation uh, trees randomly at each step until we will end. And then with this paper sequence, we replace each paper with the journal where the paper is published from. This is our journal sentences. Now we feed these journal sentences to word to vec model, which allow us to get the vector representation of journals. So basically each journal now is considered as a natural language word. This is what our embedding space looks like in the 2D projection, right? It's unlike previous system that assign a discipline category, we don't assign that. We give you a coordinate in the high dimensional space. Each dot now represents a journal. However, to facilitate comparison with the existing system also help us understand interdisciplinary structure. We color these journals based on their disciplines defined in the UCSD map of science as shown before. What we find is that surprisingly these 14 disciplines show pervasive overlapping structure. It's pretty hard to tell them apart from each other. They're very mixing. A close examination shows they are nuanced, mixing, mixing micro cluster and potential misclassifications. For example, this is the same map we just drew out. Uh, the bottom inset, bottom left inset shows a group of archeology span or geo geography journals that are classified in the previous system as earth sciences, but they're actually very close to social science and humanities in our map verified based on cosine distance. Uh, you can see many of these examples in this map. So our embeddings such shows that there's so much growing in the interdisciplinary research we are doing and of course, this is just an overview of the paper. Um, and the key message is that a growing interdisciplinarity can really pose challenges to the evaluation of novel ideas that often bridge multiple disciplines, like the research happening 
at NICO, the School of Management, Communication, a lot of disciplines. Traditionally, we're not doing computational, computationally heavy work. Now we bring large scale of visual data right, combined with surveys. So how do we evaluate these cross-disciplinary ideas? And uh, this is quite speculative, you would say, but in the next study, we actually examine how novel research are evaluated at journals, right? So this research concerns the long-standing issue that in science, peer review actually favor conservative ideas over long, over new convention or groundbreaking ones. So even the celebrated physicist once said, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its components, but rather because its components eventually die. New generation grow up and familiar with and carry on. But do we have any systematic evidence for this favorism for the conservatism? So we test the association between novelty and acceptance using 27,000 manuscripts submitted to 49 journals, including both rejected and accepted submissions in the life and the physical sciences. And we use a popular and a validated measure, turns out to be Brand's famous algorithm, to calculate the novelty of each paper submission. And then we leverage regression models to control for extensive confounding factors related to the content of the paper, the author level uh, characteristics, such as you know, citation impact, previous uh, publications, the rank of the institution, right? So what we find is that journals actually favor more novel research. This is quite surprising relative to what we all think about, right? This figure shows the predicted probability of acceptance as a function of novelty quintile. So it shows relative to manuscripts in the bottom quintile. Those in the top quintile are about six percentage points more likely to be accepted. And it's consistently observed across this large collection of journals in two research areas, even more pronounced, actually most pronounced in the top journal cell. Um, the six percentage points may seem small, but think about the average acceptance rate. It's actually, relatively speaking, it's a really big effect. So does that mean Max Planck is wrong? Well, not necessarily. If we look into three different review stages, many desk decisions, so you send your manuscript, editor make a quick decision, do I want to send this paper out for peer review? Right. And then the second review, second stage, external reviewers read your paper, right, write comments, and send it back to editors. And then in the third stage, which is the final review, editors make a decision about do I want to reject this paper or not? R and R will accept, right? So we fit a regression model for each of these three stages. And what we find that is the editors strongly select for novel research, right? However, the peer reviewers are not responding positively as much to novel work as editors do. And furthermore, when the reviews come back, editors continue to select for novel work, conditioning on reviewer recommendations. And these effects are largely more pronounced in the top journal. Excel, cell reports. Um, so the key message is that peer reviewers do not select for novel research despite strong editorial preference. And future research needs to understand why this is happening. And also my third project is about question. A few slides to um... The data set. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just looking at that. 27,000 manuscripts, 49 journals. Yeah. How did you guys get this data? Can you share that with us? 
because this is pretty this is pretty amazing yeah so like the life the life science journals uh cell cell reports is like flagship journal by Elsevier. They are interested in understanding their internal review process and reach out to us uh, way back, like maybe six years ago um, or five years ago. And then as we already finished the work, I find the results, send it to a uh, review, pass the peer review, get the comments back. We ask to revise it. And then and the, and the reviewer said, oh, this is just focused on two journals. You need to study more uh, to get into PNS. So luckily at that time, um, which, uh, a journal, um, an editor at the IOP Institute of Physics Publishing, they reached out to us. They read this paper, find it super interesting, and they want us to study their data. So we just collaborated and bring their data to our revision. And again, <laughs> Finally passed, and we find the results are consistent. It's quite lucky. Yeah, so I, my suggestion is I always um, try to look for these collaboration opportunities and contact their journal editorial office to yeah, see. Could you, could you just, you know, I, I could see that, yeah, you want to reach out to the journals. You want to make it a collaboration. But how, how do you go about setting up the conditions under which the, the information can be used. If you're looking at, you know, authors' names and you're looking at the papers that they submit that potentially get rejected. Right. So that like, or also, you know, some, what else, what somebody else is working on, maybe that becomes an idea that, you know, you start working on, you know, there's a lot of ways in which the use of this kind of data, I would imagine wants to really be protected. How did you negotiate all of that? Yeah, sure. Um, that's actually an ongoing uh, discussion with the journals. Me, I'm sure, uh, very concerned about sharing the data with us. And once we publish, how do we share the data as required by publishers? And um, we have to sign some along NDA with them, right? And for some cases, we are not allowed to even mention uh, their name in the published paper. If we don't accept that, then we're just allowed to post it on archive on preprint servers. Um, because the journals, these are really trade off between what the journals is asking for and the, what the data source is willing to provide. Top journals nowadays mostly they require you to share data, but journals don't want to do that at all. Even if you de anonymize or add noise to the data, because um, you can still like get some sense of who submitted that paper based on a few variables like, oh, the citation is in this range. We don't know the exact number. And the number of authors is in this range. It's from some institution, some demographic. Just combining five or three, six variables, you can guess who is the submitting author. So it's pretty difficult to know that. And in that case, we don't share data, but we uh, just mention where is the source? Where is it coming from? Yeah, that's like one solution to that. And the publishers are still, they, can, they will take that. So did they just give you the data and say, hey, you know, you can use this for whatever research question you want to ask as long as you... Yeah, for, for your own uh, research interest, you can do the research you wanted to, to study. But in publishing stage, you have to negotiate with them. Right, it won't allow certain research or certain pro protocols to be break breaking down and hurting their brand. Yeah, any other question? I got one more. Next slide. Uh, one after this. So, why do you think there's the the mismatch between the editor and the reviewers, and then how does that get adjudicated? in the final decision? Did you learn anything about that process? Yeah, that's a good question. We think about this a lot. So one reason might be editors making faster decision, but peer reviewers may have longer time, up to a year or two years sometimes, to review the paper. They may discover, they have different criteria in evaluating the research, 
right? So that's one reason. However, in also the sample size changes, for example, from A to B, in A, this full sample, or every paper receive a decision. But in B, uh, the, the papers that are desk rejected in stage, the first stage are not going to be peer reviewed. So it's maybe in that process, editors are already uh, selected for a pool of comparably novel work. So next work is already next novel work is already rejected. Peer reviewers don't have much to mm -hmm. look at the variation of the novelty. However, that's not supported because if you compare B and C, B and C have the same sample size. Every paper that sent out for review, you will get a final decision from editors because editors will read the review comments and make a recommendation on our reject. And conditioning our reviewers' recommendation, editors still select for novel work. So there's novelty in there. Otherwise, we wouldn't say there's strong association, especially at the top journal cell. So on the left hand, uh, ax, uh, on the y-axis, probability of success in A is like 0 0.15, just to make it easy. Is that about right? Yeah, so this is the predicted probability, but pulls from the regression coefficient. And we set the bottom quintile as the starting the reference point. That's why it's zero. Now, so it's all in relative scale. Can I interpret that the probability of getting a conventional paper past the desk is one minus 0 0.15? One minus? Yeah, I'm wondering how you set that probability up. So is it just the inverse of that for conventional work? Yeah, that's a good point. So this measure, we only measure novelty. And there are another measure for uh, the conventionality. Mm -hmm. but I'm not showing. Here is based on the same measure, but taking a different summary statistic. Mm -hmm. The novelty is the tail measure, tail novelty from the distribution and conventionality is the median. Uh, in that paper, we also find conventional work is more likely to accept it as well. So that suggests you have to combine novelty with conventionality to get acceptance, mm -hmm. more acceptance. Yeah. Oh, well, this is relative scale and comparing to the base level of novelty, if you do more novel work, did you get an acceptance premium? All right, I'll move on. So our third project studies retraction and scientific misinformation. So this problem has gone to the extent that the, there are two retracted papers in the top 10 most discussed papers online in 2022, according to our metric. So we conducted a large scale study by combining two data set, one from our metric, another from retraction watch. We want to understand how pervasive are retracted papers shared in online platforms. I would identify about 4,000 retracted papers have full access to their historical metadata. And we compare this set to a set of comparable non-retracted papers based on matching algorithm. We find that retracted papers receive more attention before retraction. This happens before retraction across all four types of platforms, including social media, blogs, knowledge repositories, news media, and even on top news like New York Times, Washington Post. So the takeaway message is that retracted papers are shared more widely on online media than truly novel research. So. Next, I'm going to a um, question. Okay, I'm asking question. So retraction. So um, how do you know retract retraction? Um, <clears throat> retraction received more attention, or attention actually increase yeah. the chances to be retracted right. because you have a more attention, and then the, there yeah. may be a lot of eyes on, on your work. And yeah. the more eyes, there is some some the you know the computer science in GitHub, and more eyes will have like code yeah. catch more error. Right, that's a good point. So, uh, to understand what's the reason behind this uh, attention, uh, we find that yeah, that's one reason. Script scriptism needs to uh, retraction. Um, but also find that. 
even excluding those criticism, you also retract papers also get more attention. So it's like two effects are playing at the same time. You get more attention, but you also get higher fraction of uncertainty. But even excluding those like criticism, you still get more attention. And more attention can needs to probably needs to retraction. However, that's not the um, main effect. We can also show that when we exclude um, like, uh, criticism about the papers, they also get more attention. So retracted research indeed get more attention. Can I get a follow-up question then? So you have this novelty measure in the previous research. Yeah. Now you're looking at the retract. Have you seen the, have you looked into the, yeah, uh, whether retracted papers got more novel elements? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that might, we haven't looked at this, but I suspect that might be a reason explaining the second uh, association. Like retracted papers are indeed intrinsically more attention getting, maybe because of novelty, right? And they do more novel work and get more likely to pass peer review. However, the problem, the research is problematic, maybe intentional or unintentional errors. And then, like, no, the building on that, yeah. can you actually make a, a kind of a mechanistic relation to the or relating to the fake news, how the fake news spread yeah, yeah. and accepted by individuals who actually want to believe that what's what's yeah. inside of this fake news? Right, right. These are all interesting follow up work. Right now, we just look at the amount of tension. We haven't looked at how the trajectory of the spreading process. Okay. Uh, any other question? So do you distinguish the type of attention, whether the attention is because the results sound interesting or whether it's because of the controversy that you follow? Yeah, yeah. We, just, uh, we look at the type of criticism, which we call uh, uncertainty. So like, oh, this paper should be retracted. I don't, like on, on Twitter, people talk about, I don't understand why this paper is uh, able to pass peer review. The data seems to be not, not generalizable, so small scale, like raising questions. We excluded those attentions, and I blocked this result here. I <laughs> just want to complete the presentation. Yeah. Question? I have a question online, which I'm just going to go ahead and read to you. Is the association between retracted papers and attention just correlated, or is there a causation either way? Is there a hidden variable like journal impact factor, which may also be correlated with more attention? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I want to highlight that this is we're doing association test. We don't claim causality, but in the matching we are doing, uh, we consider journal impact. We actually these papers are from the same journal as the retracted papers control. The authors have similar number, similar uh, citation impact uh, from similar ranked prestige uh, affiliations previous productivity that's all similar and in the same research area. Yeah, but still we we can't claim causality within these closely matched samples. Question? Is there some of data down there? What has the highest weight that you would take for the moment of attention? Oh, yeah, so in the automatic database, they have the algorithm to assign weight to do to the attention you get from different platforms in the news. If you get attention from news, you have higher weight. However, we're not using their aggregated measure. We count the attention for each individual platform, and we group them into four groups, like top news, news media, knowledge repositories, social media. Yeah, question? Can I ask one more? Um, seems like on the x-axis, on the x-axis, you have the time since publication, right? Did right. you have the chance to look at the time, look at the attention that uh, subsequent to the retraction? Obviously, yeah. certain maybe certain medium you won't get any more attention, but in blogs, maybe social media, you would continue, right? Which that might tell you something about the sources of attention that these are receiving. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, we lo actually look at the attention after retraction. Uh, we find that mo you still get more, way more attention, but that's uh, expected because uh, people talk about the retraction incidents. Oh, that's bad. People react. So, but we e when we exclude those reactions related to the retraction event, the tension is almost gone, like close to zero. So it's dying out. By the time you retract it, there's no attention, no like uncritical attention, no misneeding attention. It, because already people know, oh, this is paper is retracted. We just talk about the paper overall. Give me some comments, negative comments. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, uh, I'll move on. So uh, next, uh, to address the challenges and limitations faced by these scientific misinformation, right? Uh, growing interdisciplinarity and peer review disrecognition. I present one practical linguistic solution to facilitate this adoption process. So when it comes to innovation, most innovations usually involve two steps, ideation and communication. We know so much about the ideation process, how we get resources, how we build teams, how we form collaborations, how we get mentorship, how we brainstorming ideas, how we get meetings, go to conferences. However, while people, resource, and all those equipments are necessary for coming up with good ideas, those ideas don't speak for themselves. You need to effectively communicate them to different gatekeepers and decision makers. However, we know so little about this communication process. It's really complex, really thought about in school, PhD programs, or even thought about, have you ever thought about, oh, I actually need to pay attention to how I communicate these ideas, right? So I'll, in this work, we study how ideas are communicated in funding. Most science begins with funding. So what happens in this origin point is really, really important. And grants, they boost personal and national competitiveness and success. In many fields, you no grants, no funding, no tenure. And there are numerous governmental foundations like NIH, NSF, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, nonprofit organizations, Nova Nordics Foundation, the Gates Foundation, these are the biggest philanthropic foundations supporting science. And since most scientific communication involves writing, we are interested in understanding how the scientists verbally communicate the merits of the good ideas. A recent work points our attention to a class of language called promotional words. So this paper published in JAMA last year, they analyzed about all age granted applications in the last four decades. And they come up with these compiled 100, a list of 139 promotional words based on nearly 1 million funded grant applications from NIH. They judged if a promotional word, if a word is promotional, if it can be replaced with a neutral synonym without changing its meaning. And each word is independently reviewed by two readers and they achieve group strong agreement. So some example words like here showing actual NIH grant application. A new unique K, advanced fundamental revolutionary, unique unprecedented, novel, innovative. Right? And based on this curated dictionary, they find that there is a sharp rise of using promotional words in NIH grants. However, because this paper only focused on granted applications and missing the denominator, they leave open really interesting research questions about the role of promotional words in funding. Is promotional language consequential? In other words, is, is it related to acceptance? And how is such language used? Does it match the merits of the idea or just means empathy? Right? And how does it work cognitively, mentally? So to answer these questions, we use large-scale data sets from three renowned funders, including the NNF I mentioned earlier, Novo, based in Denmark, which is the wealthiest uh, charitable foundation in the world. Um, we also get 
applications from NIH and NSF submitted by PIs from Northwestern University. So this data covers 17,000 grant applications in over 10 years submitted to um, natural, across the area of natural medical health and social sciences. They have a total funding amount of $2 billion. And we also obtain the metadata for these grants, including the textual content of grant, how the PI performed in the past, their track records, papers, citations, and also the future publications conditioning on you get the grant. And finally, we leverage computational experiments that we substitute these promotional words with their neutral synonyms to say how they affect the selection process or evaluation process cognitively, right? So we apply fixed effects regressions with four independent variables. One is funded a binary, which is, and the second is innovativeness score, as I used in the previous uh, project. And uh, it's also from, uh, Uzi Brian Uzi's algorithm, right? And we also predict the citation impact of the publications based on funded grants and also the productivity. The independent variable is pretty simple. We just look at the frequency of all these promotional words in a grant application. We use both percentage or the raw count. This is an example paragraph in actual grant NIH application. For example, of critical importance, they write, blah, blah. We will apply innovative deep learning method to unprecedented scale, unprecedented scale, of uh, population comprised of diverse individuals with unique life histories. Of course, a lot of variables play in this grand success. So we need a control for that. And we indeed include 14 controls related to the content and the PI. So for example, the length of the application may play an effect. Longer proposal may contain richer information. And the number of references cited in the paper may influence your innovativeness novel. And the rating score of the proposal, how read readable is it? How complex is it write written? And the funding amount you applied for. The more money you apply for, the more likely you may get rejected. Right. Also, the PIs, demographic features, age, gender, the previous success applications, citation publications, also had fixed effects for the application year, program area. That means which area you apply. Natural science, social science can be quite different, medical science. And the type of grants you are applying, like Young Investigator Award, Early Career Research Award, fellowships, they're all different, so we all control for these. Our first research question, are promotional words consequential? This figure shows the margins plot if, of the predicted probability as a function of percentage of promotional words. We find that promotional words strongly predict the probability of funding. This is the base acceptance rate in the NF application. So average, you have 17% chance of success. The median number of uh, the median percentage promotional words is about 1%. Well, this 1% may seem very small, but given that we only pay attention and count this special class of adjectives, this 1% means a lot. Think about it. On average, a sentence only contains about 10 words. So 1% means you use one promotional word for every 10 sentences. If you mentally think about it, you will realize, oh, that's so common. Every sentence you read, that's probably one paragraph. You have an unprecedented scale, right? However, based on our model's prediction, if you use the median level of promotional words, your predicted chance of success is below the average, way below the average. And across the full range, if Promotional words can raise the funding rate by up to one fold, going from no promotional words at all to 2%. And this result is robust when we use raw number of promotional words in the proposal. Like if you use medium number of promotional words, which is 30, 
you have a predicted below the average acceptance rate. Also replicates in NSF NIH dataset, although the data is much smaller scale from one organization. Uh, but that also means perfect control, right? Uh, the median number percentage of promotion awards is close to the NNF, sitting at 1%, and the predicted probability is below average acceptance rate if you use the median. Second question, do promotional words reflect merits? In other words, is the packaging aligned with the product? Well, it just means empathy or exaggeration even, you might wonder. So we use the four dependent variables to approximate merits. That is productivity, general impact factor, innovativeness score, right? The innovative score is as I talked about earlier, we predict, we find that promotional words strongly predict the novelty score. Based on the margins plot, shows that what every 1% increase in promotional words is associated with one half point increase in the innovativeness. And the maximum increase you can get is just by changing promotional words is 2.5 point. This may sound trivial, but just think about it. We are using the content, a special a tiny class of words to predict novelty. And novelty may be more impacted by the PI's previous experience, right? Or the te textual content, how you write about the grant. And this really shows the power of these words. Using promotional words, give you a big increase in novelty score. That means it really reflects those novelty or merits. And additionally, when we look at the general impact factor of publications based on the funded grants, we find that every 1% increase is associated with average two point increase in the general impact factor of the papers you will publish when you get the grant. Results are more robust, pronounced for the maximum general impact factor you can publish paper. It's about four point increase. And the association between P words and our productivity is also positive, but less striking as the citation impact at the journal level. These results are robust when we use normalized journal impact factor by different disciplines. So like medicine, you have journals that reach 100 over 100 impact factor, but in social science, we may not have that much higher. So we use normalized measure, still consistent. And finally, how does these promotional words work? It may be very complicated. So as a first step, to test these possible mechanisms, we use promotional words substitution experiments, where we use computers to simulate experiments by controlling all the content, other content features intact. We replace each promotional words with one of the neutral synonyms. For example, in this actual age sentence in the proposal, further a unique and key aspect of this program, blah, blah. And then after replacement, it becomes further a specific and a central aspect of this program is X, Y, Z. And then we apply these deep learning models, cybered, fine-tuned based on the scientific context of sentiment prediction to assess the proposal level sentiment before and after the replacement. For each proposal, we do 100 repetitions because replacement happens randomly, right? And then we also vary the level of replacement from 25% to 100% to see how this trend becomes more senior. Right? As we're seeing here in this figure, we find that across all three data sets, promotional words after substitution, they have, most of those grants have significantly decreased sentiment than the original proposals. And as you change the level of replacement, the decrease happens even more fractionally. So at, for example, at 100% replacement, 
every promotional word is replaced with neutral synonyms. Almost 80 or 90% of proposals experience a significant decrease in sentiment level. So in summary of uh, this research, we find that promotional words strongly predict funding probability, innovativeness score, uh, citation impact, and also future productivity. And this finding is robust to research areas, grant type, application year, content, the PI's characteristics, also generalizable to three funding organizations in the public and private sectors. And in terms of potential mechanism, we find that promotion awards likely can evoke more active cognition, such as sentiment, about the merits of good ideas. Yeah, so this is the end of the uh, presentation. Unless you guys think about the questions you want to ask. Um, so overall, this uh, talk presents an end-to-end um, method using algorithm data. How can we address the limitations in spreading or adopting innovative ideas in the full scientific innovation pipeline? across all areas of science, including funding and publishing. After you publish the work, how do you get attention on media? Question. Thank you. That was a great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, if you could go back to your previous slide. Um, I, I'm, I'm half convinced about your findings. I wonder uh, whether... Um, actually running another set of experiments where you replace uh, neutral language proposals with mm. promotional language, if that has an impact. Because right now you're basically arguing the the great ideas are in there and promotional language just emphasizes that so people right. actually pay more attention to. And I'm not yet convinced about, about that uh, I, w I would have loved to see an experiment that actually turns that around in order to strengthen that conclusion. Yeah, yeah, that's a great su suggestion. It might be very helpful to do the inverse. Oh, right, you now you don't focus on promotion words or the decrease. You look at neutral ones and add enhance those words with some promotional nature. And does it actually increase the cognitive attention? Not just maybe a sentiment like arousal, um, like uh, violence, right? Yeah, um, but I suspect we could also get uh, consistent results because based on these, the current experiment, right? They are still comparing. You will increase like after. Because you're implying that the brain Well, it's not the other way around. It's still the same, right? You, when you change neutral words with more promotional language, it gives you more cognitive activation. What if those uh, proposals, they are also mer of merits ideas, and they are just using core language, right? And in that case, if it actually increases cognitive attention, you get more acceptance or attention in the evaluation process, and that's a success. Means we are recognizing this all oh, merits if it matches the innovativeness of the grant. I thank you very much for the interesting talk. I just had a quick question about the specifics of the experiment that you did. So you said that you kind of replaced these promotional words with some neutral language and then fed that into some kind of algorithm to determine what the sentiment was around that grant. Yeah. Um, could you describe in more detail like what that algorithm is is doing exactly? I understand it's some kind of language yeah. processing, but I'm wondering kind of if 
the algorithm's determination of like the sentiment is like also specifically based on the appearance of exciting language in the text, like these promotional words. Oh, sure. Let me show you. Like, oh, so this, in this example, this is the sentence, right? The original sentence has two promotional words. When we replace it, we get the same sentence, but all the other context, like figures, all the other texture information are unchanged. They stay the same. And then we use that algorithm to predict the sentiment score of two versions of the same proposal and how much attention, do, how much, what are the positive sentiment do we get? And we find that, so also because this is computer simulated experiment, right? Uh, the algorithm's perception of attention may be different from humans actual reviewers perception. So it's a approximation. Uh, it has some merits because it's really hard to do human experiments at this scale. And it's almost impractical if you send this to real reviewers by changing the, some of the words and ask them to review again. Um, it's costly and also can't do it at scale. So we use this approximation, use simulations, but still, in these experiments, a lot of these con content are perfectly controlled. And we're not assessing individual word sentiment. It's overall, what's the uh, sentiment of all these sentences like, containing the promotional words? Not just one particular sentence or one particular paragraph. It's all the, looking at all the promotional words containing sentences, what's the average sentiment, and then we do that again for the replica, non-promotional replica, and then we compare what's the change, is it significant, and how many of those grants do change. That makes sense. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the question that was asked here. I, I, sorry, I don't know your name, Max. Um, so Max, were you, are you worried about doing the inverse? Because if you insert promotional language, it's falsely increasing the attention to not such good ideas, thereby making the not so good ideas more likely to be accepted when they shouldn't be. Yeah, the, the question is, is, is the positive assessment driven by the language or by quality? And I think the argument could have been made. I mean, this is, in, in my limited understanding, not knowing enough details about the study, going halfway. And the other halfway would be to study the inverse. Uh-huh. I see. So I guess the, the measure of quality here, how is yeah. the novelty measure. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, also yeah. your future performance. Yeah. Like, uh, in the future. Where do you publish? So I guess what you would want is you'd want to hold the, a novelty, Max, this is for you, hold the novelty measure constant and at a certain novelty measure, if you then yeah. increase promotional words, yeah. does the novelty score go up? Yeah. Ah. So well, no, would no, that no, happen? Novelty score won't change because uh, it's based on the references so you're not changing that information, you're just changing the words. Uh, and these words are, they can, so in a judgment, it's, can, uh, it's promotional because it can be replaced with a neutral word without changing the meaning, right? So when you do this substitution, you are really not affecting the intrinsic novelty or how the essence of the idea is the same. So what the core message is, Having good ideas is important, right? In the previous, uh, the more novel work and more acceptance. And what this work shows that that's not enough. You need to have alignment. Good packaging combined with the product have the best of the, both world. Having good packaging helps you make people see the merits of the idea because those ideas are so complex. Because it's new, never, no one has seen before. 
and it's abstract in grand applications. You don't show evidence, no results. It's just abstract, aspirational ideas. I'll propose to study something, something, but no one knows what's next going in the future, right? And it's really um, uncertain. No one knows it's going to be successful or not. It's risky. Then how do we get it? Uh, or activated about giving you a positive uh, decision. Saying package is important to promote good work. Content. Yeah. So basically, if I understand that correctly, right. that if you have good content but not the package, yeah, then it actually is exactly. And so I'm not. Yeah, you do. You you can still do the inverse, right? And that's gaming the system. And that's only after you see the results. Very good. Yeah, right. But what I was saying is after we notice or observe this association, then we should design policies to regularize the use of such language. Can't excessively use it. It's such a powerful tool. Why do we extensively spoil it, spoil it? Right? It's really hard to find a good way to help people say the good ideas and get it published, accepted, spreading online media. Yeah, question. The, the part that was a little bit, I wouldn't say unclear, but I was less sure about it was the inference that was made based on the sentiment, which was generated based on an algorithm. So yeah. I think the claim was because the sentiment has fallen, therefore the perceived quality of the work would have fallen as well. Did I yeah, yeah, that? yeah. As long as you focus on perception, right? Right. Because there's two variables. You have the intrinsic quality. You only you understand, but how people perceive about it, that's another story. Sure. So that's the communication process. And probably you have thought about this. It might be very trivial, but it, it might help uh, reinforce this argument if you would say. And I, I understand this scale is huge, so you can't do replicate was for the entire data set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe for social science where people, ordinary people would have some opinion on, mm -hmm. you could take a small sample, mm. run it on MTurk, where, yeah. whereby you modify the language or use this triangularity where you would compare the unmodified, two, two unmodified abstracts, let's say, short yeah. passage, modify one of them, show it to another person, yeah, and yeah. get their opinion. That's a great suggestion. I think it may address the remaining. It would concern. reinforce basically. You have a large yeah, sample where right. you are inferring yeah. using the algorithm, but this would reinforce it based on. Yeah, now we are studying actual human or reviewer perception, not the algorithm's perception. Um, right, but algorithms they are trained based on humans' <laughs> perception, so it's kind of in agreement, good agreement. Um, question. Yeah. Is it more positive sentiment that is yeah. and is that something that is seen in other kind of texts? And is it something that like higher sentiment is increasing active cognition and something else that you notice that when is it in other context? All right, that's a good point. Um so we use that uh cyber algorithm is trained on uh, it's supposed to be a general purpose uh, large language model, but trained on scientific context. And also, in scientific context, it may still be generic, too generic, generic because in, in paper review, might be quite different in grant review and how you write, the context can be different. And we, uh, given that cyber, we fine tune that based on human labeled uh, sentiment of the actual grant in our data. So it's tweaked specific to that context. And we just look at the promotional words in those grant application context. Yeah. Like we're at one o'clock. How thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you.